folks. So uh, welcome to um, Cultivating Safe and Inclusive Table. Um, so hopefully that's the panel you're here for. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Dawn McIntyre. Um, I'm the host and producer of World for Initiative. It's a YouTube series. Uh, I also GM, I'm a player, um, and I do stage management, so I deal a lot with um, interpersonal and uh, group dynamics. Uh, we have uh, Mari Brown, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Mari Brown, and I do um, a lot of LARC and tabletop crossover, um, but we I'm writing a book for McFarland Press on safety and calibration tools in story games, and um, doing a lot of work with with groups to help um, think about the player um, and not just the game. And I'm an educator, and so I take a, like an instructional design approach to uh, game design. Hi. 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 Uh, Hello. <laughs> I'm Ed Canal, psychologist. I am the uh, creator and host of Psychology at the Table, talking about how to make your table inclusive for people who are struggling with anxiety or depression, uh, learning difficulties. I also am a therapeutic dungeon master. I run uh, two different gaming groups. Uh, I, pra I practice Southeast Psych, uh, where we use tabletop gaming as a tool for young women to feel empowered, to learn how to speak up for themselves, and to build self-esteem and work together in groups. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, so kind of the first topic I uh, wanted to touch on is on um, the fact that we're playing a game uh, with tabletop RPGs, so it's meant to be fun. Um, but different people get different things um, out of it. Uh, maybe did you want to touch on this a little bit more? Sure. So one of the things that it, we can do with role-playing games is it's a great way to experiment with ways that you want to be. Uh, with the tables that I run, especially for therapy, one of the instructions I give with character creation is make your character good at something you struggle at and something that you want to develop or something that you would like to be. Uh, so, for example, for uh, my shy players, try to get them to play really charismatic, talkative uh, characters. Or for somebody who is uh, very unsure of themselves, trying to play a character that just jumps in and doesn't really think about the consequences and is very active. And so in the, these ways, like tabletop gaming is a great way for us to experiment around with different ways of being and learning how to be something that we might not feel we are naturally. Mm -hmm. That'd be a good way to develop those skills as well. Yeah, and um, I think with that, it's also nice to, um, especially for the GM, if you have a game that you know you want to run a story or something like that, um, mm -hmm. to set up the tone and kind of overall intention and all of that. And that's something you can do in a session zero um, or kind of in, in a, like I sent out to my players in the game I'm running, a here's a quick overview of kind of the history for it, a basic idea of where I see the game going. Um, but also I told them I'm open for feedback of where do you want to have your focus on and setting up very early on that open communication is really important um, to make sure that everybody's having a good time and that if some if there is something that somebody's not enjoying or if they would like to see it go in a different direction having that open communication early on um, makes it a lot easier for your players to give you feedback and make sure that everybody is having the type of game that they want to have. Yeah, I would refer to that as transparency. Um, and uh, transparency, sometimes people are like, well, transparency, I have to have surprises and gotchas in the game, right? But transparency of the, the, the plot um, and those things is different than transparency of like expectations and uh, safety and how you will be treated and what kinds of things you can uh, expect again, what kinds of things you, you might encounter. And so uh, Session Zero or some of the other tools like Lines and Veils um, and also some opening up about um, if you have players who are actually using the game to sort of experiment with areas of their self, that is a lot of responsibility <laughs> um, because you're asking people to be super vulnerable and um, if everyone is not sort of aware and on the same page, mm -hmm. then it can be harmful, yeah. um, not, um, not necessarily intentionally, but it can be harmful if the other, was, other players don't know. So, um, awesome situation where like it's being run by yeah. the therapist, <laughs> but like if like um, other people are, are doing that and maybe you don't know. Um, have you ever had the player that, that 
suddenly snaps when one thing <laughs> one thing happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, like and you're like, you're like, whoa! You didn't realize that that was going to be so mm -hmm. close to home. And then sometimes you don't have a strategy for how to deal with that. So talking about that up front, um, that it's sort of expected that that might happen. And here's what we'll do if that happens. Um, is a good way to have openness and transparency. Yeah. So you mentioned um, lines and veils, and for mm -hmm. pe anybody who doesn't know, um, lines and veils is setting up. So lines are hard. These are things that will not be in the game. Mm -hmm. um, they're hard lines. It's not going to happen. Uh, and then veils are things that can be alluded to. Um, might be some things that you kind of do a fade to black. Um, like I. I had a fade to black moment where two of my players started flirting and went off to a tent and I faded to black because it was like, oh, that's my husband and one of my really good friends. We're not going to role play this. <laughs> um, but setting up those lines and veils, um, the difficulty with lines and veils sometimes is that you have to know, this. that's something you establish uh, in a session zero or at the start of a game. Um, and some, some people will have, like, uh, GMs will have their players write down what their lines and veils are mm -hmm. if you don't want to um, share them openly, like, especially at conventions or playing with strangers where you might not feel comfortable opening up about, like, this is, these are the things I don't want to play. Um, but that also requires knowing mm -hmm. what your lines and veils are. And sometimes that, I've even had things where I thought like, oh, I'd be fine with this and I get to it in game. And I'm like, oh, I'm not. Yeah. Well, I think the important principle there is that consent is continuous mm -hmm. and changing, right? And so um, just because you did the lines and veils discussion at the beginning, um, yeah, maybe I didn't think about something, right? Maybe mm -hmm. we were doing, or maybe it became more intense as the session went on, or mm -hmm. it was fine in session one, and then in session two of the game, you know, I'm something has happened in my life, or I'm more tired, or more emotionally vulnerable, and so having that mechanism that it isn't once and done um, mm -hmm. is super important to do at the beginning of a gaming session, but recognizing that people are people and that their needs and desires change, and so having a mechanism. So I've been in situations where they've been like, well, you agreed to it at the beginning, so we're going yeah. <laughs> with it. You, you know what you signed up for. And it's like, actually, this is a game that's unfolding. So I didn't know every single thing that I signed up for, did I? Yeah. Right? And so um, remembering that, mm -hmm. too, I think helps. Yeah, and just that, that continuous conversation and checking in. like. Um, even if you think that you're going to be doing something as a game master where your player shouldn't have a problem with it necessarily, like trying to put an opportunity for character growth, I think checking in with the player, like you don't have to tell them what's going to happen. Like I just did this on uh, the game I live stream where I emailed one of the players and said, I'm going to be foreshadowing some stuff for your character. I'm thinking of having them kind of grow in this way. Are you okay with that? Because like one of the things is our game we play for fun. You know, it's just enjoyable. And this character has been one that's a little shallow and isn't really too involved in the world. And so saying, like, will it be fun for you to play a character that starts taking on more responsibility? Is it going to be fun for you to have a character that is worried about consequences, is thinking about this stuff? And if it wasn't, then I was going to change the plot. But, you know, and you don't have to tell them exactly, you know, oh, you're going to do this, 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 and this. You know, these are the things coming up. But... It, as long as we're checking in to make sure that the game is still fun and enjoyable for everybody. Mm -hmm. like You can have fun and grow as a person. You know, it's not mutually exclusive, but it, it's figuring out how to make it that way. Yeah. And the using the checking in is um, also really good if you have a really emotionally charged mm -hmm. session to check in to make sure everybody is, you know, spe like, especially like character death, um, yeah. stuff like that, um, just checking in. And, and then also checking in to get feedback of, hey, how do you, how are you enjoying um, the session? I ran um, a couple of sessions in the campaign I was building, and I checked in and I said, hey, is there anything you want to see more of, anything you want to see less of? I got some feedback that like a couple of my players want to do more puzzles. I was like, great, I'm not good at puzzles, but I'll try my best. <laughs> um, so, so that's a good, and, and it's keeping those lines of communication open. There's a pedagogical principle uh, called differentiation um, that I think is really good to use in gaming, is that you're gaming for the people who are in front of you, right? You're not gaming for the hypothetical pure gamer or the hypothetical person that would be there. And so when you are GMing or when you are co-playing, 
you have to sort of calibrate and adjust your what you're giving them as a GM um, and how you're reacting and playing as a player based on who's at the table, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, I was just you know I was just at a game last night and you know one of the players' mo's was snarky comment that shut down everything, right? And uh, <laughs> it was like okay after the third snarky, snarky comment that shut down everything, we now know that this player's at the table. Right, and we're gonna have to deal with this player for the next three hours. Right, so, so how do we? As uh, I wasn't running it, um, and my and the GM was was very good at it, but the rest of us also had to calibrate, right? Because our we now had an expectation, and what kinds of things we would throw, and how we would mitigate, and whether we were gonna stand up. Because you know, the first couple of times, like you know, snarky comment, you were like, okay, maybe they're in character, right? Right, and then then you were like, all right. Um, so differentiation has this notion that um, people are here for different reasons and different goals and have different experiences and different styles and they're all here together. We have to work together for whatever this is. And so if, uh, if you're trying to go, well, this is the thing and either you come along or you don't, then you're leaving people behind, right? And you're giving people a negative experience. Whereas if you can tweak and calibrate, it's hard. It requires a lot of adaptability, but you're trying to remember that... Um, and, and many of you do that already, right? Like you were just saying, I want to give this particular player this thing instead of things. So you are differentiating, um, and, and that's an important thing. Um, there's a famous comic of like people trying to see a baseball game that some people may have, right? And you know, and it's like the the one the one person's tall, they can already see over the fence, and the other person, if they stand on one brick, they still can't see over the fence. Mm -hmm. And the, the other person, if they stand on one brick, can see over the fence. But so the idea here is that the first one doesn't need any bricks, right? The second one needs two bricks, and the third one needs one brick. So you're like bringing them up to the same experience. And if you try to think about, that doesn't mean that you're being unfair, right? It means that you're you're building um, building an inclusive table, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What else? Well, and one thing too is like. We talk about, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of session zero and checking in with your players and asking them how things are going and if they're enjoying the game. Uh, one thing, though, that I've figured out is people are terrible at figuring out what kind of game they like to play. Until they figure right. out what they don't, don't like. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, they'll come out, like, and I include myself in that. Like, when the game I play when our Dungeon Master was first asking us what we wanted to see, I was like, I want tons of puzzles. And then we get to puzzles, and I'm like, I don't know how to solve this. I don't want any puzzles. Like, can we just like not have puzzles? <laughs> and and like, you know, just to be willing to roll with that and understand that, like, you know, you you can set up like what you think is the perfect game for the people at your table, and then they get to the stuff, and they're all like, "Wow, this isn't what I want." And then as DM or GM, you just got to be willing to go, "Okay, how do I roll with this? How do I adapt?" And sometimes it's okay to go, "All right, I need a week to prep the game you guys seem to want to play. I prepped something." It doesn't seem to be working. Let's take a, give me a week. Let's come back and try this again. And that's okay because as long as we're making it fun, you know that's what people want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I did want to talk, touch on a couple of other safety tools. Um, so I've uh, used and been in games that use the X card, um, and the idea is this: is that um, you put a card on the table that has an X on it, and if ever there's a part of the game or a topic that comes up that you don't want to play, you touch the X card, and um, kind of rewinds, imagines that like that last couple of seconds didn't happen, and you move on, and there's no discussion. Um, and that's something that's really important when you are using safety tools: is acknowledging that like. Um, the person running the game, you don't argue, you don't try and convince, you respect that person's limits and boundaries. And it's okay to and to check in with them, like especially on a break, and be like, hey, are you okay? They say, yeah, great, move on. If they do want to talk about it, you can take a couple of minutes to, to chat, check in. Um, but um, X card, I'd like for like fake games, uh, story-driven games, where especially the players do a lot more storytelling, where the GM doesn't have as clear a line of like, this is the game that we're playing. Um, and it's something the GM can also use. Mm -hmm. If it's if your players start going off in a direction that you aren't comfortable taking the game, you can use that. Um, it does sometimes, um, I think, can be a little constricting just because if there's something that you'd rather like, well, I'd like to skip over this rather than just pretend this didn't happen. Um, but that's something that can get 
brought up. I need to um, figure that out. Just yeah. Too. Yeah. Um, a, a similar um, is uh, script change. Uh, uh, you can find out more about it. Uh, Bree Sheldon is the person who came up with that. And it's the idea of you have three cards, a uh, fast forward, a rewind, and a pause. Um, so the fast forward is essentially like fading to black. Let's skip over this section. It happened, but you don't need to role play it. Uh, rewind is for things that, you know, okay, this crossed a line, we're going back. And pause is just a chance to stop and say, hey, I need a moment. And you and figure out do we keep moving forward or do we rewind? Yeah, I would just want to add that um, sometimes you'll have people who are really into whatever direction you were going, and then you have someone at the table tap the X card or tap the pause, um, and you'll have other people at the table just sort of blurt out, "Oh man, right like." or why, what, where that we were going, you know, and, and that's actually making it unsafe or um, counteractive, and so that does fall, if no one else steps up, it falls definitely on the, the GM to say, hey, uh, we, you know, this person tapped the X card, that's inviolate, right? We don't, we don't give them any, any mm -hmm. shade um, for doing that, nor do we uh, ask for any, you know, explanation or, um, and, we, and sometimes it might be something you were introducing as the DM, right? And so sometimes you can kind of feel hurt um, because you had this cool thing, <laughs> right, that yeah. you wanted to introduce and somebody tapped out of it and, and you were like, oh, and, and it can feel, um, you can feel a little offended or defensive um, about it and um, that's the sort of a natural feeling to have because you have prepared it yeah. <laughs> and wanted to do, but also you have to just Hold it in and be like, okay, that's that's inviolate. Um, we we don't we won't go there. I have let's do this other thing. But you can also you don't have to just get super disappointed and quiet. Like you can go, okay, boom. So they tapped. All right, cool. What should we do instead? Right, and turn it to them to give you some ideas because these are supposed to be collaborative, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, sometimes it's hard for um, sometimes the paradigm has been that the that it's the DM's responsibility to be in control and to do things to the players, right? And I'd like us to try to think a little differently that the GM is sort of driving, but the other people in the car get to say when they want a bathroom break or, <laughs> you know, or something, and that, um, that yeah, that, that's... Well, you're bringing up a good point that... Uh, as the GM, you're the leader at the table. Like, you're setting the tone, you're setting the rules, you're setting the expectations, and then it's up to you to enforce that. Mm -hmm. And we all want to think that our friends or the people that we're gaming with are mature enough and awesome enough to respect the rules, respect each other, and not need any guidance. Um, but I will say, have you met humans? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we're all terrible at times. Like, I, I all, Especially yeah. when the adrenaline's going Yeah, when you're yeah, getting yeah. excited and you're yeah. getting into the role play. And like so if somebody taps that extra, they're just like, oh, like I had such a cool thing planned next or whatever. And just as that GM to be able to step, step back and be like, hey, remember our rules, remember what we agreed to, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, to kind of look at the player that went, oh man, it's like, hey, dude, I need you to apologize. I need you to own up that that wasn't cool, that pushed it too far. You're making other people uncomfortable. And that's a hard thing to do. We don't like to admit we're wrong. We like to all think that we're awesome and we will never do anything that hurts other people. But the truth of the matter is, is we hurt people all the time without meaning to. You know? And it doesn't mean they're a bad person. So I'm like, yeah. I mean, something like Scrabble, right? Like, you know, you have a, you have a, a word that you're planning to use next, mm -hmm. right? And darn it, the other person, of course, uses letter. that letter, <laughs> right? And now you're like, ah, I'm bored it. I have to go back to the thing. And so um, these are natural sorts of feelings. So I think um, it's not like you suddenly turn and go, how could you use, you know, mm. you bad person for doing that? Because these are, these are natural things. So um, shaming, shaming never good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've touched a lot on the safety tools. We want to touch on some uh, making gaming accessible uh, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, I know I have a player in our group who is uh, partially colorblind. So uh, I sat down because he brought this up because I was drawing out a map and um, he couldn't tell the difference between two of the colors I used. So I gave him the dry erase markers and said, let me know which ones 
are work best for you. Um, and so there were like the orange I took out because it was too similar to the red and I mm -hmm. think the green. So I was like, okay, I've got black, blue, and red are, uh, and then I think I've got a purple uh, that he can differentiate those colors well enough that I'm like, okay, I'll just put those other ones away. And this makes it a lot easier where we aren't, uh, cause that first game who's like, what's this, what's this, what's this? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what other kind of accessibility? I think it's, when you know what the issue is, it actually then becomes pretty easy to make accessibility mm -hmm. issues around it. So like um, with having to add up damage, uh, especially at higher levels, like have math buddies. Uh, one of the things that I've started doing in my larger group groups is I have people buddy up. And so it, they go on the same initiative, they have to plan and coordinate and work together, but then they also add up each other's dice. So if you're like getting fumbled and excited and you're rolling on this dice, you've got somebody sitting next to you helping you do all the addition. And that helps a lot, especially for people who struggle a little bit with math or just get anxious when all the attention is on them. And you can be great at math, but then when everybody's suddenly staring at you, it's like, oh, what's six plus three again? Um, 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 right? And so having that buddy who the attention isn't on them, but they're sitting there helping you can be something that's really great. There's a lot of invisible uh, disabilities, right? And so making the assumption that someone doesn't, um, that someone is in all ways typical um, is, is, a typ is, a, is a flawed assumption. Um, and so um, in terms of accessibility, I like to broaden it a little so that it's, um, yes, you can have things like, is my table at the right height so that someone who is in a wheelchair can actually come up to the table? Um, is there accessible pathways and things like that for um, or the color blindness or you can have dysgraphia people who don't have difficulty writing right or people have difficulty reading out loud or people who have difficulty with math but in terms of accessibility I like to broaden it to things like is this accessible to new players mm -hmm. right so um, if I'm bringing in uh, someone who um, doesn't have a lot of gaming experience um, how do I make this game accessible to them um, and I like to include that as part of accessibility. Also, um, people's emotional uh, state. Um, so pe some people are um, not just neuroatypicalness, where you have difficulty picking up on social cues or um, can get stuck. Uh, sometimes players will get uh, quite stuck on a specific thing. You're like, no, the game is not f about fixing this flux capacitor right now, right? <laughs> the game is actually about these other things over here. And you're like, but, but, no, no not important. <laughs> right? But let it go. But it can be really hard for, for mm -hmm. some people, um, particularly uh, if they were really invested in that or if they're neuroatypical. But also, um, people's, people's levels of tiredness. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I haven't slept well, my patience is, you know, not as, as high. Uh, if I'm hangry, <laughs> right? Hanger is real. Hanger <laughs> is very real. And so, like, those kinds of things, I have sort of lumped in a little bit to accessibility because, mm -hmm. um, uh, like, my, I don't have all of my coping tools accessible to me to do mm -hmm. if, if I've been pushed in another direction or a, not allowed to take a bathroom break or, or any of those sorts of things. So, yeah, I think um, breaks are definitely important. Um, breaks in gaming. Yeah. yeah, breaks in gaming. People, just people feel nervous about leave, leaving the table, right? You know, mm -hmm. They're like I really want water. <laughs> yeah, and then um, I've had a couple sessions that I've ended. I've wrapped up a little bit before you know I necessarily planned on because I could see that people were. They were getting tired. They were getting irritable, and being okay with like not going with the with the set plan, but um, acknowledging that like, hey, if we end the session a little early tonight, we're going to pick it up in in a week. We're going to have a lot more fun with this session than if we try and push on and get to the end of this dungeon, and it's like, well, your characters might want to get to the end yeah. of the dungeon, but the players probably are going to have a more, more fun if they're coming at it a little bit more fresh. You get to that point where you're like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Do whatever. <laughs> Do whatever. <laughs> Do whatever. <laughs> Do whatever. <laughs> Let's not check for traps for the 5,000th time. <laughs> and the next session you're like, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, yeah. Uh, How are we doing? We're doing good. Okay, um, good. So I wanted to open up if there's any um, questions that 
you all have. Yeah. So you mentioned checking in when there is an emotional moment. Uh, a lot of GMing I do is online over Roll20, mm -hmm. like strictly text, so that's more difficult to do because it's harder to tell when someone's upset and it's just in plain text, right? Any strategies to deal with this? I mean, you could sometimes read into text a little bit, right? Yeah, but it's somebody, harder. It is a lot harder, right? You know, so if someone who's normally chatting a lot all of a sudden isn't, you know, to send them a private message and say, what's going on? I notice you're seeing me a little more withdrawn, you're a little distracted today, or is like the story, you know, not going in place? Or if you have come to a particular session where, like an NPC, everybody really loved you, they failed to save, you know, and just to check in with everyone, say, how are you doing with this? Is the game going okay? And just kind of have some standard questions, and even just to open that up, like, we're, we're, you know, we're playing over the internet, I don't get to see you guys, I don't know how you're reacting. Mm -hmm. You're playing over video or just text? You're on just text, so, just text. Um, but you have the main channel, and you have... Yeah, we have, like, Roll20 and then Steam. Yeah, yeah, I mean, most people have others. So use the other channel for check-in and have a keyword, right? Even if the word is just check-in, right? And so DM to a specific person, or at the end of the scene, pause for a moment and just say, check-in, right? And then, like, the keyword comes up or whatever it is, and then you give a... And then people can thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, right? And then move forward from there. Um, but I, when I do online stuff, I use one channel for the player and one channel for character chat, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that, that's helpful for, for keeping those two things separate. Mm -hmm. And I let them know that they can always personally message me um, if they are doing um, in addition, because sometimes they don't want to put things in a group chat. So. Uh, bringing up the differentiating the player and the character, sometimes it's nice to have um, like a hand signal for out of character conversation yeah. if you are in an in person around the table. Um, our group has come up with this. <laughs> <It's> this. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what, whatever it is, something that you're not going to do. Because um, yeah. that way you can, especially if you are in a group that really like the immersive role play, um, you can have those out of character, like, my character knows this, but I have completely forgotten X. Or you can talk to the GM um, without kind of fully breaking that role play. Uh, so yes. Um, I can deal with other players that um, have like very varying schedules. And how do you deal with inclusivity for, well, I would call me in for overtime just because somebody simply was unable to do their shift, so now I have to leave game halfway through. I'm going to lose out a whole bunch of game time and all this other sort of fun stuff, and the parties are going to go me. How is there any way to help deal with that? Because this happens a lot in my game. That, uh, scheduling, I think, is always the toughest thing. <laughs> like, we're talking about like the most difficult part of a tabletop role playing game. It's getting everybody to the table, <laughs> right? The table one thing like, but then, like, having them have to leave halfway through is hard, too. Um, it, gosh, it, on. Dragon Talk, they interviewed somebody whose name I'm going to completely forget, um, who's been running a campaign for over 30 years. And what he does with his group is they all are part of the same guild and they have a necklace. And when they're able to play, the necklace vamps them to wherever the party is. If they step away, they get sucked into their necklace. And so that way, the character just can kind of leave. It's just sort of like, oh, you know, Slog just got sucked into his necklace and will hopefully return at some point. And so that way they don't feel like their character was just left back in the town and doesn't get to do the exploration or whatever, and they can, there's this narrative reason for them to vamp in and vamp out. Yeah, so that's like totally that. what I was going to suggest, is that you have some way that the character moves along. Um, well, then, yeah, but then there's still, no matter what, what you're missing out on, sure. everything that's happening, and then yeah. there's a great feeling of being Foam. left out, yeah. and mm -hmm. on purpose even. Like, well, why couldn't you guys have done a side, side plot since it was like the last bit of day and nobody had been planned for it? You got the main plot of the whole, which was side plot while I'm gone. It, well, and that can be something that you can address in a session zero or, and, or a check in session zero halfway through is to say, like, look, we've got this plot, we, we have it moving on. If for whatever reason you can't be there or do, do stuff, if we have it, you know, if you let me know a week in advance, you know, we can do a honey heist that week or something else. But if it's going to be a last minute thing, if it's midway through the session, like, we can't, like, we can't make, you know, sometimes, like, 
that's part of it. Is like everybody has made the time to come in just because so and so has to step away. Like we can't derail everybody. You know, five other people's. Then you would help the other person step away being the healer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but as long as that's not always happening, like I think. I think people need to understand that. Like, that's kind of unfortunate, but it's life, right? Like, it's a problem if you have one person who's always getting uh, put upon or always going through. But there's basically the, if not me, then you, right, kind of things. Like, another night, it might be me. And, mm -hmm. and, but if we all sort of are understanding and also um, catch up, right? It's important if somebody misses something that, that you actually consciously catch up, right? This is what happened. Yeah, and, have, uh, yeah if... if you don't have a designated like note taker in your group if you know somebody's going to be missing part of session or all of session um, have somebody take notes and shoot an, an email or just when you get to the next session they can read back through um, I like doing that anyhow just because it uh, like my gaming group we usually game every other week so sometimes it can be like what did we do last time <laughs> we need the um, but that way you know, the character, you can catch up. Um, and also, if you're in a group where, uh, the, like, one of the other players knows your character fairly well, you could hand off your character sheet, and um, they can kind of at least have, especially, like, halfway through a session, it might be harder to explain why this character suddenly is not there. Um, so your character's still involved a little bit, um, even if you can't, unfortunately, play the character for that whole time. One thing I've done is done small video recaps or video mm. re appreciations if somebody's had to leave and so we just like you know take out your phone and kind of go around the table and then you send it off to them and then they feel like they've been uh, yeah. been included and uh, we missed you and here's what some of the stuff that happened and we come back. So. Yes? And I think you had Also going that uh, something my group has done is that if someone can't make it They'll do a quick, like, uh, direct message uh -huh. to do, like, some things in role play of, like, what was your character doing while you were gone? Especially if someone's going to be gone because they're going to be out of town for a long time. Mm -hmm. But still wants to keep in contact with what everyone else is doing. Oh, that's a good point. And it's a great thing, you know, to bring it back with a lot of stuff, is just check in with Session Zero. It's like, are we going to record the sessions? Like, do we audio record or video record? Do, you know, if you miss, how, as a group, do we want to handle that? Because that way, like, if the whole group has agreed that if you have to miss, then we'll, we're going to pause the game and play something else, or we're going to do something, you know, we already know what the expectation is. When that happens, it's expected. Right? I just want to touch right back. Does anybody else run online? Anybody, uh, okay. <laughs> so the thing about online uh, is that you get random people, right? Right? Um, you get sometimes you get people who are coming back to your slot, but you also can get random people. And so I just want to state that um, at the beginning of every session, um, taking the time to do the five, ten minutes or whatever it is to set the goal expectations and the transparency of those things. Sometimes people are like ready to play, right? And you're like, I don't want to take too long with the expect expectation talk. Um, but you, um, it's time well spent um, because then this, the play will go. Uh, more smoothly and they'll have a, an avenue for and here's what you should do if you have an issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, go. Yeah. Um, to back and give us all the rest for your question, um, one good thing is making sure, think of it like uh, a teacher or a professor, like they have office hours. You don't have to have a specific time that they can come speak to you, but always, like every session, be like, hey, by the way, I make it a regularity that you're saying, hey, if anything happened in this session, we need to chat. Then it doesn't feel like somebody's being called out specifically, like I realized what you were doing or I realized that you weren't because first you're already having trouble telling if somebody because you're using text. That gives it the, everybody always knows that the door is always open. Mm -hmm. And then if something happens in the session and it doesn't feel like, hey, now I'm going to talk about it because this thing happened and I feel like it might be strange, if you make it a standard and it doesn't feel like nobody else that wasn't involved is like, oh, I know, so and so's upset about blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it a little easier to make it a regularity thing so that you know the door's always open. The question that I had, though, um, uh, is I, um, I, run, I run a decent amount of games and I grew up in playing Dungeons and Dragons, and it's a lot of 
white dudes, it's a lot of straight white dudes. I was gonna um, say, I want to talk about gender and, uh, and uh, ethnicity inclusivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I guess my question would be, I have a, I have a number of friends who um, are women that want, that have played in other sessions or with other people, and because of the um, toxicness of some people that play mm -hmm. games in the world, uh, turn them away from the hobby. Mm -hmm. And I uh, enjoy hanging out with them, and I enjoy the games that we play you know, besides that. And I want to try to involve more people, and I want to see more diversity in this hobby, because I don't want to just play with straight white dudes all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to just play that same story every mm -hmm. time. Um, so I guess my question would be, do you have any advice on one, bringing people back to the fold when they have had a bad experience with this hobby, um, and two, uh, I guess, on top of that, just reaching out and broadening those, like, I guess, advertising to people that are not in it, to say, hey, come play the thing that I like. Yeah. Um, I think one important thing is acknowledging that, um, like if somebody brings up like I've had these bad experiences, first acknowledging that, not being like, well, not a, not all guys are like this way, not all gamers are like this way, because we know. But being like, yeah, I don't allow that kind of that kind of behavior at my table, or I don't want that kind of game. Acknowledging it and then saying, I that's specifically what I don't want to do. Um, one thing that um, I've done with with my homebrew is I just whenever I'm creating a character, I randomize a whole bunch of different things because I'm like, well, that gives me a nice broad, like, because I'm like, it, most of the characters, it doesn't matter what gender they are, um, uh, like ethnic, ethnicity, stuff like that. It, um, the place I'm playing the game in, there, it's a very much a like crossroads area, so um, there, it's kind of a like, oh, okay, well, this character's from this, uh, country, so they're going to look like this, um, and uh, that will give you. Because I know, f for me, when I'm playing in games, when every NPC I run, run into is a guy, it's like, are there no women in the world? <laughs> are there no individuals who are, are non-binary? Are there no, um, you know, a, other than this one? Uh, and also that makes the NPCs a lot more interesting because like when they all uh, look alike and, and act alike, it's hard to remember like which NPC is this because I, they're all, they all blur together. Well, let's, let's face it, um, there's a lot of stuff in the hobby still that is very, very problematic, right? Um, I, uh, I was just uh, subscribed to something drive through RPG and it like sends me these different things for for uh, stats and ideas for plots and they're all very male centric and they're all very uh, you know get in here and kill um, and they also include things like capturing a woman and other things and I'm like wait what, these are you know why um, and so bringing up I think first of all advertising and being upfront on your description of your whatever your your game your Facebook channel your whatever it is is that we are open for players of all genders all ethnicities right all things we are an inclusive uh, gaming group um, to actively work to subvert some of the tropes that exist in the gaming right and uh, state that that's part of what you want to do three when people are at the table or online introduce themselves and their pronouns right and let people, uh, you know, understand that and have that be visible, right? Um, you know, for recognize, as you said, that there have been bad experiences and state that um, I, we, this game is, this gaming group is actively trying to work against that. And if I do something that, um, that you have a problem with because I am a human being who was brought up in a culture and I also have uh, mm -hmm. in some cultural biases that I'm not even aware of, right, then you should then please point it out to me um, and we will, we will work on it together. Um, I, uh, you can do a lot with things like who's in the photo <laughs> of, the, of the game, right, or just those, those sorts of things all help. And actually, I think you have a comment, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add, um, just as somebody who has had bad experiences in gaming, yeah. 
I'll, um, <laughs> okay. um, the thing that made it most okay for me to return to gaming is knowing that people I'm playing are safe. Yes. And that means, like, not even in character, not even at the table, but, like, if somebody makes a sexist comment, you, you say, hey, that's not cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You uh, establish yourself as an ally, as somebody that I can trust, and somebody I feel safe with. And then that makes me more willing to play a game with you. Because I know that, like, it's not going to cross those, those crazy, like, oh, are we capturing women in this game? Mm -hmm. um, lines. Only women. Yeah. We're not capturing women. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, and I, this, these things all blend for me, right? Like, like, in order for a game to be accessible, and in order for a game to be inclusive, you have to have people feeling safe, right? And, uh, and the player's more important than the game, right? Yeah. And so, and that's it, is that if you've said something, you're like, my character's a pig, right? Well, okay. Your character can demonstrate that he's a jerk and a pig without making, without crossing a line that actually is, you know, making, and, and you have to also state, I, I, you wouldn't think you would have to state, but I have to state, like, every time that things that have to do with me as a person <laughs> are not role playable, <laughs> right? I am not... I am not the character. You don't don't talk about me and my body or my age or my hair or my, you know, anything. But but people will. Yeah. Well, the point you were making with the art, though, I think is something important to think about. It's like the game I, I'm a player and weekly, like our dungeon master will like lament a lot of times of like trying to have female characters and then trying to find a bit of artwork to represent that character that isn't boob plates. <laughs> you know, right? and, and, and it can be hard, but like that's so important to pay attention to that detail because like these over sexualized images and things like, just it doesn't feel realistic. It's like, oh, that's that's the game, okay? That's not the game I want to play, so I'm not going to even jump mm -hmm. into that. Um, and if you're looking for like playing a story that's not like the kind of story that you've played before, definitely look into um, game designers who are um, people of color, women, uh, might, who fill those minority um, spaces. And because um, they've got amazing stories. Or just pick up books. I do a lot of reading, get a lot of ideas. And I try and make sure that I'm not reading all the same kind of story as well as not from all the same kind of author. And just be careful on just certain types of tropes that mm -hmm. it's super easy to fall into, right? Like, um, like, like you have a brown skinned person in the game, and then suddenly you make them a drug dealer, right, or something like that. And that's seriously, you know. But but it's like it's easy to have somebody do, or you've also had somebody. I and mean, I just had somebody last week who came out with an outrageous Spanish accent and was just trying to do this uh, stuff, and was like. Oh, but I'm have, I'm part Puerto Rican, so I can do this. And it's like, no, <laughs> this is still still problematic. Um, and also put different kinds of relationships um, mm -hmm. available. Um, like you know, uh, this is a this is a family that's led by a mom, or this is a family that has two moms, or um, things too, so that it's visible. Um, if it's visible in the fiction. Um, that's helpful. Uh, you can't always control who's at your table, uh, but you can at least try to work at what's available in the world. Mm -hmm. I've got a question over well, here. Yeah. Add on to that. Um, don't be afraid to call out the gatekeepers. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely just let them know right from the start. And I know that's really hard, especially when a lot of people who play tabletop or play games, we're all happy to introverts. The reason why we have our but if there is somebody who is a toxic person, like this game has only been played by straight white guys the whole time. That's the way my dad played, and that's the way I'm going to play. Call them out on it. Seriously. One of the things is try to assume that people have the best intentions. Um, it's uh, and then uh, and teach first, right? But then if. <laughs> uh, and then, but then don't be afraid to have the hammer, right, if, yeah. if it's necessary. But I try to at least give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you didn't know, right? Yeah, and also, yeah. like, yeah. own up when you make a mistake, because we all do. Mm -hmm. And, like, just being able to say, like, I didn't realize I was doing this thing, and I am so sorry about that. You know, is that's how we grow and how we learn. Like, you, know, you guys are in this room because I think you're wanting to grow your tables. You're wanting to learn how to do things differently. And... Growth is understanding where we need to grow, and sometimes we're just not aware that we have, you know, we all have growth edges, but we're not always aware of them. 
And so when we make a mistake to acknowledge that, you know, and hopefully that person's willing to give you a second chance. Yeah. Not sure if this is on topic or not, but <laughs> so I've got three people in my group. One of them, she's very flexible, really open to stuff. Like she'll discuss plot lines. She's sometimes willing to tweak her character if it'll make her jump on a plot hub. The other character is one guy who's not willing to tweak at all. Like, which I mean, it's his opinion, sure. The other guy, he doesn't really know what he wants. So what happens is, I, we always end up with way more side plot stuff for this one person's character, and the others. It seems like they're getting left out a bit and like the element of stuff plot. So I'm like, how can I I mean like deal with this? Is the one who's not willing to bend the one that's getting all the attention or which one? No, the one who like works with me and jumps on every plot and everything. She's the one who gets a lot of the stuff. Because it's easier, right? Well and it's also more rewarding for you, right? Yeah. Because it's more fun. It's like I we love building up uh, stories where people um, are invested, right? Yeah. And so when they're excited, it's like, yeah, yeah, I can feed off that energy and get excited back, you know, and maybe even just to call it out to the players, of like, I want to draw your character in more, I want to do it, how can I connect your character? What are the things that connect your character to the world? How can we build on that? But like, it, it's super hard when you're doing a story arc for somebody and their response is like, that's cool. Yeah, whereas you've got someone like, oh, that was amazing, oh my gosh, okay, so what does that mean about, you know, that's the part of play you naturally want to engage with. Um, so sometimes too, though, it's to understand not every person's right for every table, right? Like if you have, if you're somebody who really loves character food, or players who are getting super into it and jumping back, you know, diving into your story and talking about it, you know, those are the players you want at your table. The players who are just more, I just want to show up, roll my dice, and then go and not talk about the game between sessions. Maybe those aren't the right players to have at your table. So that can sometimes be part of this, is understanding who are the right people to have at your table. Mm -hmm. I, uh, well, I, I don't mind them being there. I just, I feel like I'm not meeting their expectations of coming up with enough stuff for them. I have something really small. Uh, I have to do a, that's a great idea. Who will you bring with you? And then see, sometimes they'll, uh, they, then you pick something, you, you, you take, up, you know, do you, the other, other people want to go with, right? Um, and then that can help be a little more inclusive that way. Um, you might also use um, check it, especially with those two other players, and see, like, hey, are you feeling like your character's being left out? Because uh, they might actually be like, no, I really enjoy all, where all the stories are going, and maybe they don't want the focus on them. Um, I've had a couple of games I've played in where I'm like, I am happy being the supporting character. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just at a point where I'm like, I don't want all of the attention on me. So check in and see if they feel that way, great. Um, and if not, that can open up the conversation of like, great, here are some ideas or ask for specific questions of like, do you have an idea of a side, like look at something in their backstory and say, and ask like, Oh, would there be a side plot involving the great uncle that you wrote about in your in your backstory? <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Yeah. So I just kind of want to jump back to the comments about the player that had a character that was uh, Spanish and was playing it with a I forget the adjective you use, but ridiculous Spanish yeah. accent. Um, and I was doing like muchacho with everything and going all the way through, yeah. yeah. Kind of what I'm wondering is, like, again, I'm a straight white guy, right? <laughs> um, and this is, like, sort of on the player's perspective side of things. How do I approach playing characters that aren't like me? Because that is something that sure. I want to do, because that's most of the point of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to give an example, I am currently just starting up a game that's in sort of an ancient Egypt analog. Mm -hmm. And the character that I ended up having was a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And how do I play that in a way that's going to be respectful and inclusive and not appropriate and being like, I'm, because I'm playing something that is not my experience. I don't sure. know anything about it. How do I approach something like that without making an uncomfortable space for someone else? I think that's about like building up that personal character, right? And just thinking about, okay, so what's, what's her backstory? What are the two or three defining moments of her life? And then everything that she does in role play, like 
put it through those filters of like, okay, she had experience X when she was seven, where she saw the world was this way, and then when she was 12, she saw this, and then when she decided to go questing, this is the stuff. How does that impact how she sees things? And don't worry about so much, I think, the trying to fit what you think the stereotype might be, but just right. come at it from a pure character perspective, right? Well, what I'm more asking is, I mean, that's generally an approach to role playing anything. Yeah. Um, how do I do that in a way that's not going to be problematic? So do your homework, right? Do your do your do your research. Uh, do your, uh, every time that uh, every time that you find yourself wanting to go to specific wells, you need to uh, stop yourself for a moment and say, "Am I uh, am I re embodying a stereotype?" Right? Ask people if you uh, if you know uh, and interact with folks who are from the different heritage than you. Uh, talk to them, right? Approach it with respect, and also be honest, right? Like, look, I'm playing a woman of color. This is, this is a character for me. This is not who I am, um, but I'm, and I'm seeking to, to portray it uh, respectfully and honestly, right? Now, it sounds like you're playing a woman of color, not like in modern times, right? And so you have a little bit more uh, leeway. But I would also encourage you not to sort of define your character on like uh, everything is about their. Uh, their blackness, or everything is about their womanness, right? Like because they're complex individuals with intersectionalities, and if you make it about that, then like you've turned them into a a cliche, right? There should be they should be this full you know fully embodied embodied person who is walking through the world in that in that body. Um, and, and I think something to remember too for game masters especially is when you're creating characters, the world you created, unless like you're doing some sort of Earth story is an Earth. Like, the game I play in my Dungeon Master, like all of the women that we interacted with, uh, with that were powerful, were just mean all the time. And it's something I called out. I was like, I'm really getting sick of running into all of these females in power who are super mean. And, and one of these was like, well, you know, they had to make it in the world. And then he had this aha moment. He's like, it's not Earth. <laughs> if they don't have, men and women could have just been equal the entire time of this. It's like, all right, I'm going to readjust. I'm going to fix this. But like again, it was a bias he had that he didn't realize until Jess called out on. So, um, so we're going to do this last question, then we have to wrap up. So. I just was, what you just said made me think that part of the answer was expect to fail, uh -huh. and then have a plan for when you fail. Yeah. Right? So expect at some point that you're going to embody some stereotypes, and maybe just a common thing. You know, maybe just something that happens, but then. Make sure that you're in a position where you're recognizing it's a possibility, and then you know what you're going to do in the sense of like, oh crap, I just did this thing, I'm really sorry, I understand this was bad, you know, uh, I'm sorry I did that, you know, maybe that's a point where you have a pause. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but just giving yourself like, making sure that, uh, that you know, <laughs> or at least you're prepared. Because <laughs> when stuff happens to you like that, it breathes, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the worst thing. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Gen Con. Oh, yes. Uh, you can find me um, at uh, our R4I vlog on Twitter and Instagram, and we are Roll4, the number four initiative on YouTube. I've got cards if you want to pick that up to remember. Um, uh, I'm, uh, you can find me at learnlarp.com. Uh, it's probably the easiest place. Twitter, I'm at Megan Siding, M E G A N P S Y D, or YouTube, uh, Geeks Like Us, the E's and Geese are threes. <laughs> oh, and I should say, I do run LARP Chat Live um, that's on Twitch and on YouTube, and that's at LARP Chat Live. Yes. Cool. Right. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks.